This is a, a launch of a piece of work that we have been doing with the University of Sheffield and Public Health England, looking at developing the public health model approach to modern slavery. Uh, the report is now on our website as of this morning, and there's some other material there that you might want to look at. Uh, and I should of course say that the collaboration was funded by Research England, so thank you to them. The, the origins of this work goes back to, I think, the end of 2019, where we held some really uh, useful meetings with health professionals, uh, and we talked about a variety of different health approaches to modern slavery. And it was at one of those meetings, somebody said, well, where is the public health approach? Is that something that we should be um, examining and championing? And so uh, very shortly after that, I think one of my colleagues in the team uh, discovered Liz Such and the work that she'd been doing. Um, and if you remember, Liz, you and I met by Sheffield Railway Station for a coffee to discuss whether we could collaborate uh, all that time ago. And I think from my perspective, um, I was really interested whether the models of public health approaches to say serious violence could be transferred to modern slavery. And Liz had already started to think about that. You know, that model which talks about how do we immunize the general population? How do we um, protect those at risk? And how do we actually then rescue those who are actually at risk? So uh, how do we um, immunize the general population, protect those who are exposed and rescue those at risk? Uh, which is the model of primary, secondary and tertiary prevention uh, many of you will be familiar with. And the second thing uh, that attracted me to the work that, that Liz was doing was that it potentially is a great way for all those fantastic partnerships that operate right across the country to maybe organise uh, and frame the really important preventative work they're doing. So uh, that's the partnership. And I'm really delighted uh, that Liz has got to this next stage, which has been very much a collaboration with practitioners. So we're going to start with Liz giving a presentation and then um, there will be a panel and I'll just introduce them uh, briefly. Uh, we'll start off with Rosanna O'Connor, who's the Interim Director of Health Improvement at Public Health England and who we had a, a round table uh, just before the pandemic, I think in about February 2020. So great to see you again, Rosanna. And then um, I'm really pleased that Damien Johnson, who's the Deputy Director from the Modern Slavery Unit in the Home Office, is going to uh, make some comments as well and respond to the report. And last, but by no means least, Grace Strong, who is the Director of the Leicestershire Violence Reduction Unit and is very much doing work across the uh, piece on uh, violence reduction, but has been thinking a lot about modern slavery. So that's the plan, then we'll go to Q&A. If you've got questions you think of as people are speaking, by all means, put them in the chat and I will keep an eye out for that. Um, or when we get to Q&A, just raise your hands. So hopefully, uh, without more ado, um, Liz, you're very welcome and uh, let's share the screen and uh, hand over to you. Thanks very much. <clears throat> really appreciate that introduction and <clears throat> excuse me, I'll just share my screen if that's okay. Okay, hopefully everyone can see that. Um, uh, the, uh, the title uh, uh, slide there. So uh, my name's Liz Such. I'm an NIHR Knowledge Mobilization Research Fellow working at the School of Health and Related Research at the University of Sheffield. And I just want to start with a quick thanks to the whole team. So um, as Dame Sarah said, this was very much a collaboration between the University of Sheffield the uh, Office of the Independent Anti-Slavery Commissioner and Public Health England. I'd like to also thank the participants and the funders that have already been uh, mentioned. And a quick note just um, at the start on um, survivor presence at this um, presentation, at this discussion. So this is a survivor informed space and uh, people with lived experience may be here and they may not wish to identify themselves. The basic uh, principles of uh, discussion are here, obviously there will be discussion at the end, and a note on terminology too there about survivorship. So personally, I'll refer to people with lived experience of non-slavery as survivors, but I also recognise that this is not always used and that other terms are used in the sector, especially when investigating crimes. So I sometimes will use the term victim to acknowledge this while remaining respectful of survivors' experiences and thanks to Survivor Alliance. 
So over the next 15 minutes, I'd just like to um, give you a short background to the work that, um, that we've done um, and then move on very quickly to the research that um, has been launched today. I'll share with you the findings and demonstrate the outputs. So this is on in the form of a microsite or a, a mini website that contains all of the outputs from the piece of work. I'd like to talk a bit about next steps as well at the end. So to start with, um, some quick background to the work. So this was a programme of work um, that I started with Public Health England quite a long time ago now, so way back in 2016. When I went to uh, the agency to help them explore what public health could do to address modern slavery, so this was just shortly after the Modern Slavery Act. We conducted a rapid evidence assessment and identified that public health may in fact um, reflect a change in emphasis across the anti-slavery field in the recent past. So the movement away from a solely criminal justice approach towards more of a social justice approach. And we um, established that this uh, framework on the right hand side were some of the components of a public health approach that was emerging from the literature and emerging from the discussions that we had with stakeholders at the time. And this was very much extended in a policy roundtable at PHE and with the commissioner um, in February, uh, um, just before the pandemic began. So um, the, the, there is a reasonable uh, background to the work and it's, I find it always helpful when um, presenting on this topic to, to give a brief description of, of what public health is, because I think we all, that we all have some idea of what public health is, but um, it's always useful to revisit it. <clears throat> so put simply, public health is um, both a science and an art of promoting and protecting health and well-being, preventing ill health and prolonging life through the organised efforts of society and helpfully public health is a very broad field of both thinking and practice. Its overarching approach is to solve complex health and well-being challenges um, that is prevention focused, is data driven and often takes a multi-agency approach in its response. There are many other characteristics of what public health is and does um, but those are the three core elements that we derived from the workshops that we conducted um, earlier this year. So prevention focused, data driven and multi-agency. We discovered through the research that this might be um, a useful way of thinking about how to address modern slavery that was inclusive of, but could also substantially build on the four P's approach that we're all aware of. So pursue, prevent, protect and prepare. And this is because there are many crossovers between a public health approach and the four P's, but also some new opportunities for extending our thinking and practice in these domains, especially with regard to prevention. So to examine these opportunities and also to uncover some of the challenges, we undertook this new study this year to develop a refined and operationally focused public health approach to modern slavery. So the research undertook a deliberately participatory approach, and I think that's one of the strengths of this work, is that the building of a public health approach has been um, constructed by people that are both the producers and the users of the knowledge created. We had to do all of the work online uh, because of restrictions, and um, we managed seven online workshops with 48 participants, but there were many more people interested in um, co-constructing um, a public health approach to modern slavery. And we simply just didn't have enough time or resource to be able to involve everyone. So the work will continue refining and building uh, these outputs. We wanted very much um, together as a collaboration to build some actionable outputs. So things that people could use and guide their practice um, in their day-to-day -day work or in a way um, of constructing policy and practice. And we use the existing framework that I showed you before as the springboard to the discussions that we had. And these were the three broad areas of the findings. Firstly, um, there was a further expansion of the case for a public health approach to modern slavery. Second, there was a discussion about how the framework could be refined and expanded 
to include both service design and service delivery factors. And third, we discussed in detail what preventing modern slavery should look like moving into the future. So we had quite a helpful and long discussion about prevention models. To give you a quick flavor of the findings, we discovered that there was an appetite for a different approach to addressing modern slavery. And this was often framed in terms of the quote that's on the screen. So in terms of the limitations of a criminal justice approach. There was a sense that a public health approach could offer a way out of what was referred to as a cul-de-sac, so a cul-de-sac of the criminal justice approach, and towards something that was more holistic, more victim-centred, that had a human rights or a social justice focus, and that connected to other agendas, um, so agendas such as a homelessness and serious violence, and that was inviting to all partners, and so something that people could adopt um, and adapt to. This wasn't to say, though, that a public health approach wasn't without risk or would be a cure-all, but it was something that was seen as a viable alternative that people across the sector could coalesce around or gather around. In refining the framework, participants indicated that a public health framework could be an umbrella that could help guide policy, strategy and practice. And it also offered opportunities for us to assess counter slavery work at a systems level and answer questions about what is being provided to whom and why. And this very much reflects the work of, work of the violence reduction units that adopt a whole systems approach to violence. A public health approach um, or framework might also be a way of achieving better coherence across both strategy and delivery at different levels. So this might be nationally and locally. It was also felt that the model <clears throat> of a public health approach set high aspirations and rightly high aspirations for the modern slavery response and it offered a helpful narrative, a clearer narrative on counter-slavery action that would include many partners working in different fields at the local level. It was also felt important to emphasise that this umbrella approach sits easily with what pr practitioners already do and so it wasn't an extra um, if it wasn't something that we could already do, it was at least something we could seek to do, which was offering a humane response to disadvantage that delivers the best outcomes for people at risk and for survivors. So there was a, a general enthusiasm um, for adopting a new framework for strategy, policy and practice. And um, the outcome was a refined framework, which I'm hoping will present on your screen. So this here, is the overall framework in summary form um, and the public health approach here which um, is part of an interactive framework um, with prevention data driven and multi-agency at the heart um, considers factors across different levels national factors uh, the regional uh, component and two separate service component components so service design and service delivery so this is available online to you now on the microsite, which I'll show in, in a moment. And it provides you with some basic um, details about um, what a public health approach is um, and what does public health uh, mean, public health approach mean. And I'm just going to quickly look at you, uh, show you some of the factors that we identified through the research that operated at a local or regional level that would help promote well-being. So here um, in the framework, we have multi-agency partnerships at the core of effective counter-slavery local action. Of course, that's something that many of us are involved in um, at, a, at a local level, but also there was a demand for um, ongoing public awareness, education and uh, readiness um, training, community resilience building, and a real desire to see systems leadership. So political and senior, senior leadership in the local system that was promoting modern slavery prevention. Also really importantly were trust building interventions uh, with at risk populations and survivors um, with local organisations and practitioners working uh, together coherently across the system. Um, trust was something which came up uh, again and again in the, um, in the workshops 
um, both when it came to designing services, delivering services, and also when um, designing uh, policies at national and regional level. So trust between partners was considered really important for effective uh, policy making. So moving on, um, we also talked about prevention um, at length in the uh, workshops. So how we might expand our understanding of what prevention is and how we might activate uh, preventative action using a public health approach. And this was hard work. So it was noted that prevention was difficult and that a concerted effort was needed across the different levels. So national, local and service level to prevent modern slavery in the round. And participants talked about how preventative work needed, needed more focus and that it faced a disadvantage in that it was hard to evidence. And so this quote really reflects that. So how do you prove something hadn't happened? Participants discussed models of prevention. So reflecting um, the uh, primary, secondary, tertiary prevention model of public health, which was seen as useful, but could be made more useful by making more accessible um, to an everyday audience. And so the research team were challenged to to promote better ways of um, identifying what these prevention levels were so that counter slavery circles could use them more effectively. Okay, so at this point, I'll just, um, I think it's helpful to look more at the materials uh, um, that we produced to support policy strategy and delivery and go to the micro site. So this will be available to you on um, online from this morning onwards. So. The outputs here are, um, are threefold, so the full report, which links to the, the report on uh, the Commissioner's website, and then um, the interactive framework that I just showed you, the single strand of uh, just now. And this is um, the, the, the guide that I think will be most useful for implementation um, at a local level. And it's, uh, it's um, interactive as the framework is, and um, comes in, in chapters, um, which it takes, it's, it's not particularly long, but includes helpful links to further information. So you can expand on areas that you might be want to develop further. So for example, trauma-informed care. Just clicking on the prevention uh, chapter, you can see that it starts off with a very basic um, introduction to prevention. So identifying that, you know, the goal of prevention is to stop it from happening. So focusing more on primary prevention or upstream prevention. And then leads to um, some descriptions around the challenge of preventative work. This was the cycle, one of the examples of the cycle of harm prevention that we adopted um, through uh, help and um, feedback from the research participants. And here again, as an interactive framework, you can see that there are um, ways of expanding on um, some of the components of this cycle. So here we move from addressing the drivers or causes of exploitation and the conditions that enable exploitation through preventative action. That means understanding and addressing the conditions that allow exploitation to, to thrive, moving through to where exploitation is likely or emerging or happening, where you intervene more at a later stage, where early intervention hasn't been enough or didn't happen, and that further interventions are needed now to treat the consequences of exploitation and prevent further harm. So hopefully these tools will be useful to um, participants. I also wanted just to take you to some of the materials on putting these ideas into practice. So how you can use the guide to develop a public health approach. And for local uh, anti-slavery partnerships looking to use um, a public health approach, we've identified three ways that we might help you develop that approach. Um, firstly, by zooming out. And here we have some materials or prompt cards to help you do that zooming out work and take stock of what you do and why. And then looking more at the maps and gaps of your local partners' uh, services, where your um, strengths, where your inconsistencies might be in terms of um, local prevention. And then another example of what the cycle of exploitation and harm prevention might look like and where you might map on your services to see where you're challenging modern slavery across the local system. Okay, I'm getting close to my at the end of my time. Um, so um, I'll just move back to the um, presentation as I wanted just to outline to you what the next steps 
So the next steps are approval concept study. So NHS England, Public Health England and the Anti-Slavery Network in the Southwest is going to take these ideas and these materials and use them in a proof of concept or a pilot study so that we, we can refine them further and also um, test them in an in a, in a anti-slavery partnership uh, setting. We also want to and will be uh, we're currently working with the one slavery training and delivery group that's been set up again and thread through public health approach but importantly we want to um, use this opportunity to apply this idea these ideas and principles further test them out implement them and evaluate them and, and, well, and um, I'd be very grateful for your feedback on some of those um, uh, some of those needs. Thanks to everyone that participated and the full team there and please contact me um, with um, uh, any queries or questions or ideas about testing and the microsites available from the resource page. Okay, I'll stop. I'll stop Thank you very me. much indeed Liz and for um, managing to become our technical operator in the middle of all that uh, to help us out. Much, much appreciated. Um, great presentation. So um, I think Rosanna has now been able to join us. Uh, Rosanna O'Connor, who's the Interim Director of Health Improvement at Public Health England, uh, very much uh, joint work with yourselves at Public Health England. But Rosanna, your kind of thoughts and responses uh, to Liz's paper. Good morning. Um Good morning. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And um, thank you to Liz. Sorry, I was um, late joining, had a few um, technical hitches. Um, but um, we really do welcome um, this, this, the work that you are leading, Sarah, yourself, and then in particular, um, the work that um, Liz has, uh, has been doing um, to cr create this, um, this report. Uh, um, from our perspective in Public Health England, the research is uh, very good and was done with um, uh, usefully with considerable impact in, input from public health and healthcare professionals. And this is an opportunity to share what um, public health professionals have known for a long time, that um, bringing a public health approach to complex problems, um, such as the prevention of modern slavery, can help move them on um, several steps. So learning from this work can support preventative approaches to other forms of exploitation as well. Um, useful to, from our perspective to say that, uh, or to remind ourselves that victims of modern slavery and human trafficking belong to in inclusion health groups. Uh, they are exposed to multiple risk factors for poor health, have extremely poor health outcomes, they face barriers in access to services and are, pri uh, are largely not captured by the data. Uh, Public Health England's priorities for inclusion health include data and monitoring of health outcomes for these groups, including victims of, of modern slavery. In 2019, uh, PHE produced a framework for local partnerships in England to take a public health approach to violence prevention. And PHE hosts a professional network for colleagues interested in taking a public health approach to violence. And in May 21, uh, PHE published guidance to support local systems undertake strategic needs assessments to understand how violence is affecting local communities. And we in PHE already provide support to violence reduction units and is improving how these uh, violence reduction units use healthcare data support to, um, to support their work. And modern slavery is another area where PHE can, uh, can provide this support. Um, we're also um, keen to help the Home Office at a national level uh, in their approach to prevention of modern, modern slavery and using this research data and the networks of public health professionals uh, to provide a, um, a launch pad um, for that work. So we are um, fully engaged and um, keen to um, continue to be part of this and um, are very pleased to be, um, I was very pleased to be invited um, to the meeting uh, today. Inish Campos Matos, who um, uh, provides the PHE leadership within the organization for this work stream, is on holiday, um, but would have liked to have been here. I know she's very supportive of, um, of, of this work stream. So hope the, hope the 
hope the meeting goes well today. Thank you very much indeed, Rosanna. And it's been, uh, as you say, really important that we were working not just with the university, but with yourself and the public health professionals um, who are steeped in these approaches. So thank you very much for, for joining us today. Um, the next person who's going to respond to um, Liz's remarks is, is Damien Johnson from the Modern Slavery Unit. Good morning, Damien. You're very welcome. Good morning, Dame Sarah. Uh, good, good morning, everybody. Um, very pleased to be here. And again, echoing what Rosanna uh, has just said, um, very much welcome this research. Um, very interested in, in anything that um, helps us uh, focus preventative activity in the best way possible um, is very clear to everybody, uh, everybody, uh, practitioners, policymakers, survivors, that prevention needs to be at the heart of, of, of the approaches that we take. Um, it, 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 it clearly reinforces a holistic approach. It clearly reinforces multi-agency partnership. Um, and those, those have to be key to uh, how we take forward our work. Um, devising a framework for preventing modern slavery is, is challenging. And uh, given, as others have already said, the complexity of modern slavery, um, uh, the, the complexity of it, the multiple drivers uh, and causes, the different types of exploitation uh, that fall under that, uh, that term, um, means that, that, that a framework that enables us to, to, to focus on the right activities in the right, uh, uh, in the right time frames with the right people um, and partnerships is is key. Um, we've also, uh, as in other, as with uh, as with other complex problems, there's a various understandings across uh, the stakeholder community of what prevention means, um, and we can sometimes uh, get caught in the cycle of of of, of, of words and, and and the power of what what does prevention mean? What's a preventative approach? Um, and something that, that helps us clarify, um, you know, the difference between preventing, uh, focusing on preventing offenders causing harm, preventing victimization, preventing um, uh, vulnerable people falling into exploitative uh, or finding themselves in exploitative um, situations. Uh, how do we how do we take a, an approach that, that that focuses on all of those different uh, angles of prevention activity, I think is, is, is important. And, and as the, the research highlights, um, this, is, this, is, this is something that lots of different stakeholders have a role to play in. Um, government, NGOs, businesses, health practitioners, um, uh, local, uh, local support uh, to, to make, uh, to make the, the, the impact uh, as, as, uh, as um, uh, as impactful as possible um, and a framework which helps us clarify the roles of that partnership um, is indeed uh, is indeed important. Um, I particularly like the practical tools that Liz took Liz just pointed out on the micro site. I think that will be very powerful in helping both policymakers and practitioners look at their responses currently test test against uh, some of the prompts in those tools and really see where where they might uh, strengthen their response, where there might be gaps, uh, or where they should uh, continue the, the focus of their efforts. Um, and, and as Liz said, the, the framework reflects what people are already doing. Um, so it's not, it's not an extra, but it just helps us visualize, um, and I would hope uh, at a national level, visualize on what are the preventative angles to, to all of the activity that we are undertaking. Um, so from a, from a, from a modern slavery at the, at the national level perspective, um, thinking of uh, the work that we have already been doing that has a preventative effect. So whether that's legislation on supply chain transparency and encouraging businesses to address risks of modern slavery in their system, through to the work we've been doing overseas with preventative uh, approaches, reaching hundreds of thousands of people overseas in some of our programs, um, the, uh, the awareness raising and the education programs that have been funded at national, regional and local level um, uh, to, to raise awareness, to spot the signs, to understand, uh, to help people, first responders uh, and others um, help uh, identify 
those who are being uh, exploited and, and the research that we're, we're continuing to fund um, uh, to, to better understand, uh, to understand the problem. So uh, we just uh, in 2019 um, to, uh, committed to 10 million pounds uh, over the next five, over the five years to fund the Modern Slavery Policy and Evidence Centre um, through the Arts and Human Research Council. Again, uh, helping helping to bring this is done, what others are doing in the prevention space together to really understand uh, what what we should be doing uh, as a collective system. Um, so, so I just wanted to finish really with uh, a look at a look ahead. Um, and some of you may know that we, the government, uh, announced in March that we would be revising and reviewing the modern slavery strategy. Um, uh, the last one was published in 2014, so it's overdue, uh, a, a, a look at it again. And part of that review will be again looking at how we put prevention at the heart of what we do. Um, and certainly I'll be encouraging us all to, uh, to take on board Liz's work and see how that framework can help us um, help us with that. We're, we'll soon be, in the next few weeks, we'll, we will we'll be uh, launching a public engagement uh, process so that uh, encouraging everyone um, to, to input their views on uh, the, all, all angles of our modern slavery strategic approach, but in, including clearly for this audience prevention um, and what, what more we should be doing in partnership. Um, and we also announced that we would be, uh, we aim to design um, a prevention fund uh, and, and we're currently looking at what that might, uh, what that might look like to help encourage and pilot uh, different approaches so that we can see where from, from, from our perspective here, what the different types of um, uh, activities that might contribute in this space. So. Uh, more more information on the prevention fund in due course, but again, it's it's just uh, symbolic of the fact that uh, we're very keen to put preventative approach at the heart of our at our approach. So um, with that, I'll, I'll hand back. But again, very supportive of this work and very supportive of the tools that come with it. Damien, thank you very much indeed uh, for that. And uh, as you say. The the timing seems to be good because you're thinking at the moment about the prevention fund and the new strategy and I would hope there'd be a real focus on prevention uh, as that strategy develops and so uh, our last uh, panelist is going to uh, comment on uh, from her perspective is Grace Strong who is the director of the violence reduction unit in Leicestershire. Grace you're very welcome good morning. Thank you Dame Sarah um, and morning um, everyone um, in terms of my reflections on um, the report and the resources, I think they're absolutely excellent. I've been busy exploring them this morning when they were first launched, and they're just so accessible and practical. And I can certainly instantly see how they can be used and applied in a local setting. Um, I think an absolute strength which shouldn't be downplayed is the fact that they've been co-produced which ensures that they are relevant to the sector and most importantly, survivors of modern slavery as well. And I think that's such an important element of a public health approach. So it's great to see it reflected in the actual production of the resources too. Um, I've been asked to kind of reflect on my experience in applying a public health approach, albeit to the issue of serious violence. And I guess what's really important to note about myself is my background's a criminal justice one. And although I was aware of what a public approach, um, public health approach was, um, until I took up the post have, heading up our violence reduction unit, I'd never applied it to a complex issue such as serious violence. And I'm sure that some of my reflections will be very obvious to some, particularly public health colleagues, but hopefully of some interest and use to, to those that have attended today. Um, one of the participants in the research um, highlighted or referred to the public health approach as a journey, and I couldn't agree more through, through my own kind of local experience. I think it's really important for local partners to recognise that there's no end destination with a public health approach. It is a continuous journey. Um, the paper referred to a way of thinking and acting collectively. I would go a little bit further and say it's a way of being. Um, a public health approach. And I mention that because I think that there is a risk that a public health approach um, can be picked up and put back down again. And although that might happen in the early stages of applying this um, locally, really its potential will never be realized unless it's fully embraced. 
So I'd very much emphasise about that, that journey and that continuous learning as a local partnership. We invested quite a lot of time in the early stages, which paid dividends in articulating what a public health approach meant to us locally. And a great strength of this research is that an awful lot of, of that has already been achieved. But I still um, think it's important that local partnerships really take time to explore the resource and come to a consensus about what it means to the local partnership, as well as what it means on a kind of national and a global level. Really important not to assume that that understanding is there because it can become a bit of a buzzword public health approach and it's worth just checking that that understanding is present locally. And the research has a great tool. Um, I think it's one of the three ways to develop a public health approach called the zooming out, which seems just really important to have a look at what, things, what this means um, to you locally. We have a mantra locally about everyone has a role, but in a similar vein, it's really important to take the time to look at different organisations and different sectors and articulate what that role is in relation to taking a public health approach to modern, modern slavery. Um, sometimes it requires a real shift in thinking. So my parent organisation um, locally, which is the probation service, didn't really understand its role in terms of prevention. And I think as a partnership, it's really worth taking the time again to connect local partners up to, to um, their potential, their current role, their existing role, but also their potential role in relation to prevention. Um, some advice that was given to me when I first started in my role, which was from the Scottish Violence Reduction Unit, is start where you are and do what you can. And I think another real strength of these resources are that it, it's strength based. It is about taking the framework and exploring what's already happening locally, who are the um, partners who are already on board and really starting with that and um, also looking for those areas um, that might need a little bit of tweaking. Um, and to me, that's all about building the momentum and the commitment so that when it comes to the more thorny issues and challenges, the partnership around the public health approach has already, um, has already got some momentum behind it. Without a doubt, the greatest challenge for us locally has been making the case for prevention. Um, you know, it's said frequently that everyone believes in prevention, but it's much harder to make the case and gain commitment. And really importantly, as system leaders, making sure we hold our nerve with that, because obviously these things take, take time and, and a, lot, a lot of the benefits won't even be realised within all, all of our careers and potentially lifetime as well. So that takes a huge leap of faith by the partnership. And I guess um, my advice in relation to that would be about building evaluation in from day one, even if that's quite low level evaluation, just making sure it's in there. And something we did locally, which has been invaluable, is we spent some time building a theory of change, which really mapped out, particularly around the prevention strategies, what the short, medium and long term outcomes would be, which has really allowed us to kind of tell our story locally as to the distance travelled and the journey again that, that we're on um, in relation to prevention. And then finally, which is a, a kind of a real passion um, for me, is about making sure we're always joining the dots at a system level. So, of course, modern slavery requires its own strategies and interventions, um, but there's also common ones which, regardless of the focus, whether it's serious violence, mo modern slavery, child sexual exploitation, there are common themes throughout. And I guess one of the ones that's been picked up through the research is around trauma informed approaches. And for me, that in itself requires that system level um, cooperation and collaboration. It makes no sense to develop that just in one sphere and not across the system. But there's other, there's other examples as well. So active bystander work, it may focus on a specific topic, but the methodology should be the same behind it. And then most importantly, I think for a public health approach is the for and with communities principle. And although those communities may differ depending on the topic um, that we're focusing on, actually there should be a shared commitment and a shared approach across the entire system if we're committed to that particular principle. So I think, um, Dame Sarah, they're kind of my, my key bits of learning over the last 18 months or so. I hope that's helpful, but absolutely ex excellent, um, excellent research. 
Thank you very much, Greg. As uh, Rachel's just said, fantastic points. I mean, you've been immersed in the public health uh, situation and locally working across all serious violence, but uh, some really great points there.